How's it everyone who's watching this? This is my second video on the channel and it's continuing the introduction to Ferdinand de Saussure's course in general linguistics. Last time, we learned a little about the history of linguistics and the three stages that Saussure says polluted it, those being the study of grammar, philology, and comparative philology. Next, we looked a bit at what would be built on later as signify and signify, the idea of a concept and a sound image. Additionally, we learned the difference between language and speech, the former being something of a social construct that organizes the chaos of the latter. In this episode, we'll learn about the next chapters of a section, beginning with chapter 4, linguistics of language and linguistics of speaking, then chapter 5, internal and external elements of language, chapter 6, graphic representation of language, and lastly, but not at all leastly, chapter 7, titled simply, phonology. To start off with, Saussure begins chapter 4 by again drawing a line between speaking and language. There are two sides to the study of speech, he says. On the one hand, we have the psychological side, the basic part as he calls it. Language, something collective and purely social, but related to psychology inasmuch as it is composed of signifiers and signifieds, sound images and concepts, which exist in the mind before being spoken. On the other hand, we have the psychophysiological side of speaking, the thing that actually enables you to speak, stuff like phonation, the act of producing sounds. Now, these two parts are closely intertwined. Speaking only makes sense when there's a language making it possible to have meaning, giving it a web of concepts and sound images to use. However, language can only also exist from speaking, or gesture in the case of sign languages. We learn our first languages through listening to people around us speaking them, and we only gain the associations between sound languages and concepts from other speakers connecting them together. On this, Saussure says, Language is both the instrument and the product of speaking, but the interdependence does not prevent them being two absolutely distinct things. Language is the sum of sound images and concepts deposited in the collective mind of a given community. Saussure gives this equation to illustrate that fact. 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 and so on equals L, collective pattern. What this means is that language exists in every person, but is also common to everyone altogether. Speaking, though, is a little different. Speaking is the sum of everything people in the community say, including firstly, the specific quirks of each individual speaking style, and secondly, the specific choices those individuals make in phonation. Whilst in language, the equation shows that it is the same for all individuals using it, the equation for speaking is this, referring to how it is the sum of only individual acts. Speech is heterogeneous, unlike language, which is homogeneous. It can't be looked at with the same viewpoint, because speech, as a whole, is too multifaceted and nebulous to study coherently. However, parts of speech can be looked at individually, what Saussure calls the linguistics of speech. But Saussure is clear that linguistics of speech is firmly separate from linguistics proper, and that he is only concerned with the latter. Moving on to chapter 5, internal and external elements of language, Saussure sets out to clarify what features of language he is focusing on exactly. Saussure starts out by saying that his definition of what language is excludes everything external to it. He terms this excluded part external linguistics, and says that despite this exclusion, that it still has a lot of value in its study, citing four examples of external influence on language. Firstly, we have the fact that a nation's culture exerts influence on its language, and that it's the language that holds the nation together. Now, that's nation in the sense of a people group rather than the political entity mind. Here, Linguistics borders ethnology. Secondly, there's the relationship between politics and language. Colonization, for example, has a massive influence on language, moving some around the world and destroying others, or carrying idioms into new environments. Internal politics also have an influence on language, as Saussure himself says. Certain governments, like the Swiss, allow the coexistence of several idioms, Others, like the French, strive for linguistic unity. An advanced state favours the development of special languages. When Saussure says special language, what he means is jargons, like the ones used by the medical institution or by the courts. 
Now, to return back to the points themselves, pentultimately, we have a connection between language and institutions. For example, organizations like the Académie Française specifically develop written standards that are taught in schools and thus shift the way in which language is learnt and therefore used. Or, to take a more sinister example, Saussure doesn't mention, the relationship between the Catholic Church and the languages of First Nations of Canada, where, through the use of residential schools, the Church essentially destroyed them. Returning back to written standards, they are also of interest as they mark departure from what Saussure calls the natural sphere of spoken language. Lastly, everything geographical about language is in the domain of external linguistics. Saussure notes that this might seem a little paradoxical in dividing between internal and external, but he states that, at the end of the day, the so-called inner organism of an idiom or language is not affected by geography. With that outline of external linguistics out of the way, there is another problem in the way of separating it from linguistics proper. Just as the inner organism of a plant is modified by alien forces, terrain, climate, etc., does not the grammatical organism depend constantly on the external forces of linguistic change? His response to this question is a yes. Yes, quite obviously do external forces have bearing on linguistic change. Just look at loanwords. However, this doesn't mean that it's necessary to look to external linguistics whilst examining the internal linguistic organism. How so? Well, just take the example of borrowed words. When borrowed words enter language from an external source like French and English, for example, they aren't thought of as loan words. They exist internally in a language system, having meaning only in relation with and in opposition to other signs in that system. The source doesn't matter. Everything in the structure is signs. The reason why these two approaches, internal and external linguistics, should be kept apart is that they both require very different methods. It all comes back to structure. External linguistics is valuable, but much more nebulous than internal linguistics. As Saussure says, Each writer will group as he sees fit facts about the spreading of a language beyond its territory. If he arranges the facts more or less systematically, he will do this solely for the sake of clarity. In internal linguistics, not just any arrangement will do. Language has a specific structure, and any change to that structure is for the responsibility of internal linguistics. He offers the example of chess. In terms of external changes, the game passes from India to Persia to Europe, in the same fashion languages spread across the world. Switching out ivory pieces for wooden ones, or vice versa, in a way analogous to loanwords, is also an external change. It has no bearing on what happens within the structure of a game. However, changing the number of pieces on the chessboard would be an internal change. It changes what you would call the grammar of the game, and therefore the overall structure. Sorry. This brings us to chapter 6, graphic representation of language. Like in chapter 3, the object of linguistics, chapter 6 is split into multiple sections, four to be exact. The first section is the shortest, and titled Need for Studying the Subject. In the section, Saussure implores the students, because remember, this is a lecture, to learn as many languages as possible, language being the object of the studies after all. The reason why they, and by consequence we, ought to study the graphic representation of language, i.e. writing, is that that is how languages are primarily learnt, even, he says, our own. Writing may be unrelated to the interior structure of language as an external thing, but it is necessary to understand its uses, dangers, and shortcomings. This takes us to part two, called Influence of Writing, Reasons for its Ascendance over the Spoken Form. He starts out by drawing a firm line between language and writing. Both are systems of science, he says, but the latter only exist for the purpose of representing the former. The linguistic object for Saussure is not both the spoken and written words, no, instead, it's only the spoken. However, he also says this. The spoken word is so intimately bound to its written image that the latter manages to usurp the main role. He calls this a mistake, stating that it would be like thinking you could learn more about someone by looking at a photograph of them, rather than just seeing them in person. The result of this mistake is that there are a plethora of misconceptions about the relationship between written and spoken language, such as, for example, the idea that languages without written standards evolve faster than those that do. 
This is false, evidenced by Saussure with the example of Lithuanian, which, despite not having been written down until 1540, offers a closer relationship with Proto-Indo-European than even the Latin of 300 BCE. Writing obfuscates the spoken language in a way, Saussure saying, Language does have a definite and stable oral tradition that is independent of writing, but the influence of the written form prevents our seeing this. He goes on to recount some of the myriad of linguists who themselves confused letters with sound, ranging from Franz Bopp to Jakob Grimm. Even in his own time, he says, intelligent people still confuse the two, leading to spelling reforms being seen as attacks on language itself. How could this be? He ends the section by listing four ways to explain the influence of writing. Firstly, it seems stable and permanent, unlike the actual spoken word, which can change quite rapidly. This makes it, wrongly, appear to be a better representation of language over time, rather than sound. Even if written language is, only, at the end of the day, a sort of abstraction of language. Secondly, because of the medium, visual rather than auditory, it's easier for written language to leave a lasting impression on someone. Sounds come and go, they don't last. For writing, on the other hand, you can stare at the same thing for hours on end if you rarely wanted to. Thirdly, the written language is what is taught in schools and what has dictionaries. One example is of Norwegian, where you have two written standards, Bukmal and Inorsk, but no one actually speaks of them. They speak related dialects instead. However, you'd be hard pressed to find an actual course in one of those spoken dialects instead of Bukmal, just like at Duolingo. Lastly, he says, When there is disagreement between language and orthography, Settlement of the dispute is difficult for all except the linguist. Since he has given no voice in the matter, the written form wins out. This concludes section 2. However, I am going to skip ahead to the next chapter, as these next two sections are mainly just focused on laying down, Saussure's notation of sounds, and complaining about spelling. Today, his method is very outdated to say the least, and has been replaced by the standardized IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet. This is what I'll be using whenever it's needed. If you aren't familiar with IPA, it shouldn't be too important, but you can always search up some videos or articles. Tom Scott is always fantastic. To begin with this next and final chapter of the introduction, I want to offer something of a disclaimer. This chapter is titled Phonology, but Saussure's definition here is very restricted and something that he would later on expand and modify. It's a rather heterodox definition of phonology and one that has only been properly used by Saussure's student, Maurice Cramont. Additionally, what he calls phonetics here, and I'll be using his terminology, is actually what is now known as phonology to anglophone linguists, and essentially vice versa with phonology. With that out of the way, let's begin. Again, the chapter is separated into sections, with the first dealing with what defines phonology. For him, phonology is the same as the physiology of sounds, the study of how sounds are articulated, Unlike phonetics in its time, which was mainly concerned with the evolution of sounds over time, phonology is atemporal, or out of time. What people make noises doesn't change at all. A result of this is that, whilst phonetics is a basic part of the study of language, Saussure's phonology is only a supplementary, connected field that belongs solely to the study of speech. Describing why he's discussing phonology at all, he says, here I am trying merely to determine the extent to which phonology can help linguistics to escape the delusions of writing. This takes us to section 2, phonological writing. The main focus of this section is to describe the pitfalls of trying to use a purely phonetic writing system in everyday language. The first concern Saussure raises is the problem of getting a multitude of different countries, like the UK, France and Germany, to adopt the same system. Additionally, there's the problem of how to actually phonetically write things down. So Sukh's time, the IPA, as I've already mentioned, didn't exist. So actually representing each sound would require a massive amount of diacritic markings, an amount that would make it unwieldy to use. This leads to the biggest concern of all, reading. In everyday life, we don't just sound out each letter we see individually. Rather, most of us read by looking at words as a whole. Just look at that famous example of reading out a text where everything but the first and last letter of a word has been scrambled up. In addition, there are many, many different words 
that sound the same that we can only tell the difference between because of non-phonetic spellings. To read out of a few, which obviously will sound a bit confusing, there's two, two, and two. All in all, Saussure's conclusion is that such writing system should be used only by linguists, not generally. Now, on to the very last section of chapter 7, and thus the last section of the introduction, called Validity of Evidence Finished by Writing. This deals with the problem posed by writing, how deceptive it is. Even a supposedly perfect phonetic alphabet wouldn't truly cover how chaotic speech is and all the different dialects that populate language. What has to be done instead, Saussure says, is the creation of a phonological system for every studied language, documenting a description of how sounds work in those languages. Saussure goes to list two ways which a linguist could construct such a system. The first and most important source they can take from the external evidence, he says, is contemporary descriptions of how sounds were pronounced in a certain period. The example he doesn't mention, but I think is quite good for this, is how we know that the letter C was pronounced like a K in Latin. Quintilian, an educator from Roman Hispania, described how the letter C was pronounced essentially as a way to moan about the kids in his day using the letter K. Native Lang has a great video touching on this, titled What Latin Sounded Like and How We Know. Going back to the text, Saussure uh, warns that these descriptions have many problems, particularly that they are often phrased quite poetically, but sometimes completely inaccurate. The better course of action is thus combining that external data with internal evidence, something that can be done in two ways. Firstly, by looking at the regularity of phonetic changes and evolution, and secondly, by examining other sources from the time period being studied. The example he gives for this first thing, looking at regularity, is what he represents in Sanskrit with C with Sedil. There's no real way to figure out what exactly it sounded like, but because it's descended from palatal K in Proto-Indo-European, the field of sounds that it could represent are narrowed down. This can be narrowed down even further, given that there are other closely related languages to compare with. The other way can be explored in a multitude of different fashions. Poems, for example, offer a fantastic insight into phonology. For example, rhyme, alliteration, and assonance all focused on similarities in sounds, allowing linguists to see when and how sounds drew together and split apart. Additionally, puns can be very useful. To this effect, Saussure quotes a story where a woman is brought before a revolutionary tribunal for daring to say that France needs a king. In actuality, what she was actually talking about was, and please forgive my pronunciation, a rouet maître or spinning wheel, showing that the French word for king, roi, was pronounced like roi during the end of the 18th century. Ending the chapter, Saussure describes how to go about acquiring knowledge on phonological systems in different periods. The only rational method consists of a. setting up the system of sounds as revealed by direct observation, and b. observing the system of signs used to represent, imperfectly, these sounds. Now, this concludes the introduction of Ferdinand de Saussure's course in general linguistics. I truly hope you enjoyed or learned something, and if you feel I got anything wrong, please do feel free to let me know in the comments so I can do better next time. Next, we'll look at a section on general principles, examining the nature of linguistic sign along with static and evolutionary linguistics. Until next time, bye!